My title, Queerer Than We Can Suppose, The Strangeness of Science. Queerer Than We Can Suppose comes from J.B.S. Haldane, the famous biologist, who said, Now my own suspicion is that the universe is not only queerer than we suppose, but queerer than we can suppose. I suspect that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamed of or can be dreamed of in any philosophy. Richard Feynman compared the accuracy of quantum theories, experimental predictions, to specifying the width of North America to within one hair's breadth of accuracy. This means that quantum theory has got to be, in some sense, true. Yet the assumptions that quantum theory needs to make in order to deliver those predictions are so mysterious that even Feynman himself was moved to remark, if you think you understand quantum theory, you don't understand quantum theory. <laughs> it's so queer that physicists resort to one or another paradoxical interpretation of it. David Deutsch, who's talking here, in The Fabric of Reality, embraces the many worlds interpretation of quantum theory, because the worst that you can say about it is that it's preposterously wasteful. It postulates a vast and rapidly growing number of universes existing in parallel, mutually undetectable, except through the narrow porthole of quantum mechanical experiments. And that's from Richard Feynman. The biologist Lewis Wolpert believes that the queerness of modern physics is just an extreme example. Science, as opposed to technology, does violence to common sense. Every time you drink a glass of water, he points out, the odds are that you will imbibe at least one molecule that passed through the bladder of Oliver Cromwell. <laughs> it's just elementary probability theory. The number of molecules per glassful is hugely greater than the number of glassfuls or bladders full in the world. And of course, there's nothing special about Cromwell or bladders. You have just breathed in a nitrogen atom that passed through the right lung of the third iguanodon to the left of the tall cycad tree. Queerer than we can suppose. What is it that makes us capable of supposing anything? And does this tell us anything about what we can suppose? Are there things about the universe that will be forever beyond our grasp, but not beyond the grasp of some superior intelligence? Are there things about the universe that are in principle ungraspable by any mind, however superior? The history of science has been one long series of violent brainstorms as successive generations have come to terms with increasing levels of queerness in the universe. We're now so used to the idea that the Earth spins rather than that the sun moves across the sky, it's hard for us to realize what a shattering mental revolution that must have been. After all, it seems obvious that the Earth is large and motionless, the sun small and mobile, but it's worth recalling Wittgenstein's remark on the subject. Tell me, he asked a friend, why do people always say it was natural for man to assume that the sun went round the earth rather than that the earth was rotating? And his friend replied, well, obviously, because it just looks as though the sun is going round the earth. And Wittgenstein replied, well, what would it have looked like if it had looked as though the earth was rotating? <laughs> Science has taught us against all intuition, that apparently solid things like crystals and rocks are really almost entirely composed of empty space. And the familiar illustration is the nucleus of an atom is a fly in the middle of a sports stadium, and the next atom is in the next sports stadium. So it would seem the hardest, solidest, densest rock is really almost entirely empty space broken only by tiny particles so widely spaced they shouldn't count. Why then do rocks look and feel solid and hard and impenetrable? As an evolutionary biologist, I'd say this. Our brains have evolved to help us survive within the orders of magnitude of size and speed which our bodies operate at. We never evolved to navigate in the world of atoms. If we had, 
our brains probably would perceive rocks as full of empty space. Rocks feel hard and impenetrable to our hands precisely because objects like rocks and hands cannot penetrate each other. It's therefore useful for our brains to construct notions like solidity and impenetrability because such notions help us to navigate our bodies through the middle-sized world in which we have to navigate. Moving to the other end of the scale, our ancestors never had to navigate through the cosmos at speeds close to the speed of light. If they had, our brains would be much better at understanding Einstein. I want to give the name middle world to the medium-scaled environment in which we've evolved the ability to take action. Nothing to do with middle earth, middle world. We are evolved denizens of middle world and that limits what we are capable of imagining. We find it intuitively easy to grasp ideas like when a rabbit moves at the sort of medium velocity at which rabbits and other middle world objects move and hits another middle world object like a rock, it knocks itself out. May I introduce Major General Albert Stubblebine III, Commander of Military Intelligence in 1983, he stared at his wall in Arlington, Virginia, and decided to do it. As frightening as the prospect was, he was going into the next office. He stood up and moved out from behind his desk. What is the atom mostly made of, he thought? Space. He started walking. What am I mostly made of? Atoms. He quickened his pace almost to a jog now, what is the wall mostly made of? <laughs> Atoms. All I have to do is merge the spaces. Then General Stubblebine banged his nose hard on the wall of his office. <laughs> <laughs>